To an overhead observer, the street pattern of Detroit presents a strange mosaic of conflicting systems, which seem to start and end with no apparent reason, and to have no relation with each other. However, the twists and turns have their historic explanations. It all began when a group of Frenchmen, led by Cadillac, landed at the site of Detroit on July 24, 1701. Their settlement, Fort Pontchartrain, was protected on three sides by water, and its four main streets paralleled the shoreline of the river. Cadillac's wise Indian policy helped Detroit to become an important fur trading post. The site, which provided a narrow crossing in the Great Lakes system, was a focal point for Indian trails, even before the white man. With its new function as a trading center, more trails were worn through the wilderness. After six decades, French rule was replaced by the British. It, in turn, gave way to American control. When the newly appointed American administrators arrived at their Michigan territorial capital, they found that a tragic fire had completely destroyed the city on June 11, 1805. One of the three judges, Augustus B. Woodward, persuaded the townspeople not to rebuild immediately, but to plan for the metropolis which he envisioned. His plan was based on an equilateral triangle 4,000 feet to a side. Each angle was bisected by a perpendicular line to the opposite side. Where these streets met, a rectangular park was formed. Large circular parks were also at each corner of the triangle. This system could be repeated endlessly, simply by adding new triangles, reversing the point each time. The plan called for a park interrupting each major thoroughfare every 4,000 feet. Judge Woodward did not foresee the effect of parks on through traffic, shown here where 2nd Avenue detours around Cass Park. The plan was opposed because of its conflict with old property lines, its maze of angles, and the arbitrary method used to determine the width of the streets. As a result, only the upper part of one triangle, bits of two others, one rectangular park, and half of one circular park were ever built. The bases of these triangles parallel the shoreline rather than a cardinal direction. The existing part of the Woodward plan makes up most of the present central business district. The old Indian trails were improved when demand or military needs necessitated and provided the major land access routes to Detroit. Even today, the major thoroughfares of the city, which radiate from the business district, follow the routes blazed centuries ago by fur trading Indians. These major routes connected rather smoothly with the remnants of the Woodward plan with one exception. It was planned to connect Grajit with Monroe Avenue. But this would have ruined an orchard owned by a Mr. Brush who successfully blocked this link and Grajit was built one block north. As a result, thousands of motorists each day must make two turns. A turn to the left avoids the old orchard site. Traffic then travels northward along the west edge of the former grove. Finally, it turns right, and the driver is at last on Grazia. The old French farms were long and narrow to give each farmer access to the river at that time the only sure means of transportation. The boundaries, drawn at right angles from the shoreline, became roads commonly named after the owner of the adjoining land, such as Brush and Bobian. 
The farmers had little objection to boundary roads, but resisted cross streets which divided their land. This has resulted in many jogs and dead ends on these streets. Thus, whereas Detroit has an adequate system of routes extending from the shoreline, many cross streets, such as Werner, were built in fragmented bits and are not smooth traffic ways. Even the egotistical Judge Woodward had not intended the avenue he named after himself to become the main street of Detroit. However, it was the only spoke street that paralleled the French farm boundaries. Woodward is the line where many cross streets change their names. Dividing the east and west sides of the city, Woodward is the baseline for most house numbers. In the 1870s, a group of citizens began a campaign for a boulevard to circle the city. An opponent in the Michigan legislature said, the district through which it is proposed to run is so wet and marshy that the boulevard would be a goose pond during the winter and spring months and a goose pasture in the summer or who would ever make use of it as a driveway? When, in spite of all opposition, Grand Boulevard was built, it too followed the traditional property lines, and for the most part is either at right angles or parallel to the river. The exact route was determined by public-spirited citizens who donated nine-tenths of the land that was used. The boulevard was little traveled for a decade. With the expansion which came with the auto industry, the route was soon lined with the stately residences of the wealthy. Today, these buildings are used primarily for convalescent hospitals, funeral homes, beauty salons, day nurseries, and other commercial enterprises. The wide boulevard commonly served as a boundary of new developments, and thus different people at different times laid out the streets on either side. In some places, these diverse plans did not mesh together well. This has resulted in name changes and jogs. A good example is Second Avenue, one of the city's busiest thoroughfares where it crosses Grand Boulevard. Outside the boulevard, an early suburb, Highland Park, was an established settlement long before its huge neighbor surrounded it. This city grew around Henry Ford's Model T plant. Its streets were built to conform with its main thoroughfare, Woodward Avenue. When Detroit grew around Highland Park, the street pattern of the two cities did not meet in all places, requiring several jogs, such as this one on 2nd Avenue. Not only is there an offset at the city boundary, but the older Highland Park streets are narrower than those of Detroit. Just as most of Detroit's older streets were influenced by the early French farms, the newer parts of the city were affected by the American survey pattern. By this time, river frontage was no longer necessary, and the shoreline was completely ignored. The land was divided into square mile sections, using a grid of strictly north-south, east-west lines. The major service roads followed the section lines so as not to cut through farms. The line drawn due west from the old city hall was considered zero-mile road. It is now called Ford Road. One mile north is Warrant Avenue, and then 
Joy Road, Plymouth, Schoolcraft, Fenkel, McNichols, Seven Mile Road, Eight Mile, and so forth. As this area was urbanized, homes developed primarily along north-south streets. Even major arteries in this direction maintained the residential character in the form of apartment or duplex homes. The east-west thoroughfares, however, became long strings of commercial development. One reason for this pattern of growth might be that the commercial streets have an average of 16 cross streets per mile, along which almost all of the homes of the area are built. The residential routes have only five cross streets per mile, along which are very few homes. Livernoy, the closest north-south street to the city core, has also become commercialized. It is one of the major used car centers of the world. In some exclusive residential areas, the rectilinear grid pattern has been replaced by a complicated system of curving roadways to discourage through traffic. Many of Detroit's traffic problems are located at points where grid and shoreline systems come together. Davison is a good example. It begins at Van Dyke, runs west, turns, and parallels the river, hitting its cross streets at sharp angles, as shown by its intersection with McNichols. Davison continues in this direction until it reaches Livernoy, where it turns due west again. It doesn't come out exactly on a mile line, however, and through traffic must shift one block north to Schoolcraft, Four Mile Road, as Davison, as shown here, changes at Wyoming from a six-lane divided highway to a two-lane side street. Even the paths of the new freeways are influenced by the grid and shoreline systems of streets. It is cheaper to use existing routes as part of the right-of-way than to cut across the present pattern. The Ford parallels the river and the lake shoreline almost exactly. The Lodge starts perpendicular from the river, runs due west to the grid system, and then follows the Northwestern Highway, an old Indian trail. We have seen that Detroit has had four basic patterns of growth. The downtown area, which is a small part of Judge Woodward's plan. The major spoke streets, whose routes were based on old Indian trails. Streets at right angles to the shoreline along old French farm boundaries and their perpendicular cross streets. And finally, the north-south and east-west streets of the grid system. Even the recent freeways have conformed to the historic routes which have formed the basic pattern of the city of Detroit. <laughs>